morning. Hey, hey. Bebe. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Leah. Hi, Alexis, Haley, Hannah, Abigail. Hey, I am. Thanks, Haley. And Jen, Melody. What's up, Mr. Caleb? B minor, Laura, Hannah Wiggy. Hey, Bing Bing. That's what Caleb says. Then he meant Bang Bong. Super bright in here. Grazzle 10. Melody Mel, Melo, Melody Mello Mel. Mayor Bear, Jacob Van Sickle, Joy Andrews. Andrews, I don't know. Maddie Love. Welcome, welcome. How are you guys? What's your favorite kind of coffee? I just recently got Dunkin' Donuts. Cinnamon roll blend, it's pretty good. I'm not drinking coffee right now because that's all I had and I didn't have food, so now I'm kind of freaking out. My heart's racing. <coughs> Sweet. Well, uh, yeah, let's, let's get to it. So the passage this morning is in Mark 8. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. So if you got a Bible, or you got your new life book, you can open up to the last one. We are doing the last uh, devotion, last passage, which is number 20. It's the devoted life. Um, so, if you got a Bible, we'll read through it and get to it. All right, Mark 8, 34 through 38. Hi, Victor. Uh, calling the crowd, along with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, <clears throat> but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? What can anyone give in exchange for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous I'm gonna fix the hearing because people on Facebook say they can't hear me. Technical difficulties. Dang it. Okay. Let's uh, start over. Sorry, everybody. I'm trying to work things out on Facebook Live here. For some reason, uh, the audio is not working. Hey, yo, Max. Sorry, everybody. Just going to get a little glimpse into how things are rolling. You guys can... You guys can bear with me. Bear with one another and so fulfill the law of Christ. Hey, Max, can I use your phone? Wi-Fi? Yeah. We're just going to go with Instagram. Hello, everybody. All right, so we're just going to go with Instagram this morning. Sorry to everybody on Facebook. Um, it's just how it's going to go. So, anyways... Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. Uh, calling the crowds along with his disciples. I already read it, so let's just pray. <clears throat> uh, Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that, um, that you are good, that you are uh, God, that you are Lord, you are in control. Um, I just thank you for these people here, even on Instagram, listening live, Lord, that you'd help us. Uh, that you teach us, Lord. We want to be uh, committed to you, Lord, as we come to this hard passage. Um, just pray you'd give us grace, give us ears to hear, eyes to see that your beauty. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, Mark eight thirty four. I'm going to do one thing really quick. You guys are patient. I'm going to go on Facebook on my laptop 
see if I can get it to work. So, sorry guys. Here we go. I think it might work. Live. I thought I was tech literate, but I guess I'm not. Just got a text message. It's not from anybody important. Okay, well, this doesn't make sense. Jacob Friesen, I feel you, man. Thanks, brother. You know, just trying to help people out, but uh, for some reason, can't get it to work. So, we're just gonna go with this. All right, <clears throat> Mark 834. Um, so, a few weeks ago, I was uh, out teaching my now fiance, Leah, how to use a circular saw. Um, and if you've ever used a circular saw, they can be dangerous. And so we're just doing some woodworking, <clears throat> just telling her the basics, the do's and don'ts of using a circular saw. These are the things you do. These are the things you should do. These are the things you shouldn't do. Um, I gave her some of the most important advice that I was given to my former boss when I used to build houses. And he told me that <clears throat> most of the time people get hurt when they become really comfortable with something. And, you know, you get really used to using something, and then all of a sudden that's when you get hurt by it. And so I have firsthand experience with this. Um, I had a nail gun, and this nail gun, uh, I became really used to it. And one day, um, I shot myself in the leg with the nail gun. Um, I'll just show you a picture. So that's the nail in my leg. Um... That's it in the skin. Sorry, everybody. It's pretty gruesome, but just want to show you that you can't get too comfortable with things like that. <clears throat> and uh, fortunately, I didn't hit any main arteries or any bone. It was actually just my skin. And so when I told uh, Leah, people get hurt with tools when they get comfortable with them um, and reminded her of what could happen if she put her hand in front of the saw. What I was doing is trying to help her to have a, a sober mind, a sober understanding of what she was dealing with. Uh, to dismantle the preconceived notions that she might have had about the circular saw. Um, and I wanted to give her a proper respect for what she was doing. And in Mark 8, Jesus is doing something really similar. Uh, there were probably hundreds of people following him. And what he's doing here is he's trying to dismantle <clears throat> the preconceived notions of what it means to follow him. Or disrupt or get rid of all these wrong motives of why they're following him. And Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow me. So he's cutting right to the chase, he says. Uh, he's exposing their selfishness. He's exposing um, and saying in this, it's not about what you want. Following Jesus isn't about getting what you want. Um, you must deny yourself. It's not going to be easy. In fact, it's a road to death. They knew that a cross was a torture device that was meant to kill people. So that'd be like, all right, follow me. Make sure you pick your electrocution up chair uh, up out the door as you follow me um, and see Jesus he would often say things really uh, thanks Jake um, he would say things very provocative like this um, in Luke 14 he tells us to hate our own father and mother and you're supposed to hate your father and mother your wife children all these people but it's like well are we really supposed to do that no he, he's pointing out the fact that you should love them more. You should love God more than these people. He, he was exposing the fact that these people cared more about these other things than God himself. Or in Luke 18, he says to the rich man, he says, sell everything and follow me. So do I actually have to sell everything and to follow Jesus? Some people might, but what he's doing is saying you love that thing more than you love me. And in Luke 9, it says, he, Jesus said to another, follow me. But the guy said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said, let the dead to bury their own dead. Let the dead bury their own. But as for you, go proclaim the kingdom of God. So is God just, uh, does he just not care at all about uh, the dead? No, he went to a funeral. He cares a lot about that. But he was pointing out, he says, you care more about these other things. And I'm calling you and you don't want to. Um, and so why did he say things like this? Well, 
uh, you know, he says, take up a cross. Are you actually supposed to grab a wooden cross and start carrying it around? No, that's not what you're supposed to do. Hate your own father and mother? No, you're supposed to love them. Sell everything? No, then we wouldn't have anything to give. And so the reason he's saying these things is he's challenging um, those who are trying to follow him. He's challenging them with a the question, are you really going to follow me? Or are you, are you really going to trust me that what I say is best? Or are you going to follow me only when you want to, only when it's easy? Because then you're just doing, then you're just following a version of God that you want to exist. So two things I just want to look at in this passage is the cost of a Christian and the cost of Christ. So the cost of a Christian. It says Jesus in Mark 8, 34, they called the crowds along with his disciples. So uh, what we see here is that there's often crowds following Jesus all the time. Luke 5, it says that there are crowds coming, listening to his teachings, listening to the word of God. And John 6, 2, it says that people were coming and listening because they wanted to see signs and wonders. So people were coming to see these signs. In Mark 9, it says that a large crowd was following him, and in that crowd were scribes arguing with him. So there's these people that wanted to prove God, want to prove Jesus wrong. That was the reason they're falling. And in Luke 6, it says that there are many where people were coming to be healed. So there's so many different reasons. So why were these large crowds following Jesus? Well, there's not just one reason. There were many reasons. Some followed to listen to the word of God. Some followed to argue. Some followed to see signs and wonders. And what Jesus is saying here is he wants to show them of the main reason why they should follow him. And so he wanted to get to the proper motivation of following him. And in Mark 8, 27, right before all this, it says, On the way he asked his, his disciples, who do people say that I am? So he knew that of those who followed him, thought he was a good teacher. Some thought he was a miracle worker, all these different things. But here's this important question. Who do they say to that, that I am? And his disciples say, well, some think you're John the Baptist. Some think you're Elijah. Uh, some think you're another prophet. Um, but then in Mark 8, verse 29, Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. And he goes on, and Jesus says, don't tell anybody this. And he, he starts to explain, um, this is my, the plan for my life. And I'm going to go, I'm going to live, I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer and be rejected, and I'm going to die. And then I'm going to rise again. And then Peter, uh, he doesn't like that. He thought that Jesus was going to bring all these earthly things to him. That Peter was going to reign on the throne with Jesus. Uh, rule and reign with is Israel, the, is the rule of the world, reigning. And uh, what Peter does is he takes Jesus aside and he rebukes him. He goes, Jesus, that's not happening. That's not how this is going to look. And Jesus looks at him, looks at the disciples, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. He calls Peter Satan. Um, I would suggest not doing that. Be slow to say that to people. Uh, but Jesus knew that and what he's saying. He wasn't saying, Peter, you're Satan. He's saying this, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So Peter just had his mind set on the things of man, not on the things of God. Um, but why did Peter rebuke Jesus then? Well, he had the wrong idea of what it meant to follow Jesus, and he had the wrong idea of what Jesus' role was in Peter's life, in his own life. And so what we need to know, uh, we must understand the cost of following Christ. And that's what this passage gets to the heart of. Jesus says, if anyone would follow me, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So the first thing he says is, if anyone would, if anyone wants to, do you have a desire? Do you have a desire to follow him? He's appealing to many here. Many people, yeah, we want to be around you. We want to follow you. Jesus, this is cool. I love seeing your signs and wonders. I love the bread that you make us. I love when you turn water into wine. And then he says, okay, <clears throat> If you want to follow me, now deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So what he's saying, it's going to cost you your life. You must deny yourself. You must deny your selfish desires. Deny what you think to be right. It's not about what you want. It's about what God wants for you. And the next thing he says is take up your cross. And it's not as if like when we become a Christian that we just get this giant cross and we just carry it around or just walk around and say, look at my cross. Yeah, that's right. I'm a Christian. No, uh, that's not what it means to take up a cross. Rather, it's a mentality and an attitude given to us by Jesus. 
um, by the Spirit of God, by the example of Jesus, to take up our cross daily and to kill our flesh, to, to get rid of ourselves, to deny our selfish desires. And it's a daily choice to do those things, to kill our flesh, get rid of those things. And the way we do that is by the power of the cross. It's not, in a sense, my cross. It's the cross of Christ. And knowing that's where my sin is, it was condemned, it was killed, the power of it was broken, and we carry that cross. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. I remember reading through that years ago, reading through The Cost of Discipleship, a book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I uh, was really struck with that. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That's what Jesus is saying, come and die with me. Come and, come and die. Let your selfishness die with me on the cross. And another quote that Dietrich Bonhoeffer has is, discipleship is not an offer that man makes to Christ. You don't get to give the terms to Jesus. You don't make the rules. Jesus does. We can't bargain with him. He calls the shots. He makes the rules. It's either you give up his life or you can't follow him. Um, and I think initially when you hear that, we hear these crazy things Jesus says, right? especially in this passage, that we must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. That he's calling us to a path to death. It seems like this is really extreme, Jesus. Like, And it also seems like I have a lot to do. Like, I have to deny myself. That's something I have to do. I have to pick up a cross, too. But the idea is that you have to do all these things to be saved. Rather, it's the response of someone who is a Christian. It's the response of someone who sees the cost of following Jesus. But more importantly, this is key. The more importantly, it's someone who sees the cost of Christ. They see the value of Jesus. They see the worth of Jesus. They see the beauty of Jesus. And they say that's way more valuable. And so I'm going to give up everything. The only way that I can receive this is if 